Hello, Fantastic Beast fans. I'm coming to you today in a haze of pollen to discuss some of the recently released deleted scenes from Crimes of Grindelwald, which I'm sure most of you have seen by now. While I can understand why most of these scenes were cut, one of them has perplexed me greatly, one that reveals powerful religious imagery. So strap in, we're going to dive deep into some ancient spiritual symbolism. I'm Susan Chapal of Fantastic Secrets Behind Fantastic Beasts to bring you the clues. Join me and other Fantastic Beast fans here on the Beast Chaser Forum as we uncover the secrets, discover what's coming first, and play along with Rowling's newest game. And make sure you hit the subscribe button as well as the bell notification so you'll be notified when videos post and won't miss out on the next clues. Welcome back to our Beast Chaser Forums. I'm sorry I took such a long break, but work claimed a priority for a couple of months. Plus, I was busy writing something new for a Harry Potter project that I hope to tell you more about in a few weeks. Now, though, I'm back and ready to dig into more Fantastic Beast theories. To get started, I'd like to explore some key moments that stood out to me in some of the newly released deleted scenes from Crimes of Grindelwald. First up, that ballroom scene with Lita and Theseus I want to thank Wesley Moore for pointing out to me on Twitter, even before I'd seen the actual footage, that my prior theory on what this scene was about and why it was probably cut was right. Seeing the dancer's veil so vividly reminiscent of Lita's drowning baby brother was quite startling. I thought it would just hint at it. In the extended cut, this scene is placed immediately after Tina meets Yusuf Kama. Lita's half-brother, on the magical streets of Paris, and before Grindelwald is shown in his usurped Paris apartment with his followers blowing the smoke of Credence's Obscurus from his skull pipe. It's a very nice link to the family history binding Kama to Lita to Credence. At this point in the film, we would not have understood what the figure in the dancer's veil was, but putting it together with Lita's Bogart, shown later, we would have guessed it was quite horrifying. The ballroom scene is beautiful, but doesn't really show us much more than what can be gathered from others that were kept. Then, the next scene I want to explore is not actually a deleted scene, but a curious snippet I was able to catch by slowing it down. Look at this bit, where Queenie steps through Grindelwald's Ring of Fire. No, we don't do it! When the film was released, I was struck mostly by the fact that the flames seemed to initially devour Queenie, like we were prepared for with the passage of Crawl. But now, I think that flaring of flames might have been a bit of red herring to distract us from the more important clue. Look at this curious detail. Watch where Queenie's hand instinctively goes as she steps through the fire, over her belly. Watch it again. We've theorized many times prior to the film's release that Queenie might be pregnant and is what motivates her so strongly to not only potion and kidnap Jacob, but to join Grindelwald. I think this movement of her hand is further evidence. Queenie tells Jacob one of them had to be brave. An unwed mother of the time, especially one who's entered into an illicit relationship, would most certainly have to be very brave. Most to-be mothers instinctively cover their baby whenever they feel themselves in a dangerous situation. I believe Queenie is doing so here. What do you think? Then lastly, we come to the deleted scene that intrigues me the most, the murmuration. This is an incredibly beautiful scene and so packed with what I believe are critical clues, I cannot imagine why it was cut. Ever since the snippet of this scene was released in the first trailer, I've had a theory that the Obscurus shooting out of the palm of Credence's hand was a hint at the stigmata. But I had so many theories going on then that this one never made it to a video. Now, however, I feel quite sure of it, 
especially when it is combined with other religious imagery related to the Obscurus in the extended version of the scene with Nagini. In some Christian beliefs, the stigmata is an imitation of Christ's crucifixion wounds that appear miraculously in physical form on the bodies of some of his faithful. The most common placement is a wound in the palm of the hands, where it is commonly believed Jesus was nailed to the cross, even if it is more accurate that the nails would have been driven through his wrist. Then there would also be the nail wounds at the feet, a slash in the side where he was stabbed with the soldier's lance, and scarring on the forehead from the crown of thorns. Curiously, an early version of Credence did show a scar on his forehead. To what purpose, though? Why would Credence bear the marks of the stigmata, in imitation of Christ, and especially at the point where the Obscurus ejects? I believe these hint at the transformation of Credence into a sacrificial symbol, and that it's possible we will see a new wound stigmata with each film as he and his Obscurus transform further. In the first film, Credence's Obscurus was a thing of evil, murder, and imagined with atomic bomb references, as I discussed in great detail in a prior video. Here, in Fantastic Beast 2, the Obscurus is transformed to a howl of Credence's pain at the loss of Irma, a force protecting Nagini, and most startling, a natural image of a murmuration. A murmuration is the movement of a mass of starlings flying in unity. While the flight of birds is always seen as a symbol of freedom, this unified flight, almost a dance, of thousands of birds moving instinctively as one, is not only a symbol of freedom, but also the beauty and power of individuals joined as one. Nagini understands this. She says to Credence, make it happen because we're free. This scene ends with what is, to me, a powerful image. The murmuration passes through Nagini, through her heart, through her womb. And this is where I see further hints of a religious subtext. In Christianity, the Holy Spirit is most often symbolized as a bird, commonly a dove, and it seemed to be a dove that cooed Credence awake as he and Nagini lay sleeping under rafters, rafters that looked oddly similar to an inverted Deathly Hallows symbol. Notice, too, how Nagini sleeps serpent-like with her eyes open. Now, watch the scene of the Obscurus, Credence's power, passing through Nagini as I read these words from the Christian Bible in the Gospel of Luke, where the angel tells Mary of her upcoming pregnancy. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit, often likened as a bird, will come over you, did we just witness an immaculate conception? I know this may seem a bit out there for many of you, but it's not the only hint in the film of an immaculate conception. The idea of the power of a God impregnating a human woman was not only found in Christianity. There is Leda. Leda's name seems to be inspired by Leda, the mother of Helen of Troy in Greek mythology. And the way in which Leda became pregnant with Helen and later her brother Pollux and often his half-twin Castor was by the Greek god Zeus who came to her in the form of a swan. Notice how the Obscurus makes a beeline for the center of Nagini. She covers her heart in anticipation. Then notice the hint of smoke both from the chimneys on top of the roof as well as billowing around the Obscurus's entry. The Holy Spirit is also associated, especially at Pentecost, with tongues of flames. Then, notice at the end, as the Obscurus is leaving Nagini, how she covers her belly, her womb, much as Queenie did as she passed through the flames. Are these scenes deliberate parallels? Queenie passing through the flames of Grindelwald and Credence's power through Nagini? Finally, Notice at the end how Credence shivers as he reabsorbs his Obscurus. One has to wonder, 
Has his obscurus perhaps absorbed some of Nagini's nature as it passed through her? And will her powers or her curse transform credence in some way? Or his, her, have they each absorbed a bit of each other, even if she did not conceive? I mentioned the flames of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. This was the day the Holy Spirit was initially sent by God to the people who believed. After receiving the Holy Spirit, Peter preached of the coming apocalypse before the return of Christ. Now, I want to read you Peter's words while showing you Grindelwald's vision in the amphitheater. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. Grindelwald has set the scene for a bomb of apocalyptic nature. Peter foretells that the one who will save the world from this apocalypse is the Christ, the child born of woman, conceived by the Holy Spirit who came upon her. In J.K. Rowling's creative and transformative hands, there is no telling exactly where she is going with this imagery, even if I'm right. But I do believe the relationship between Nagini and Credence will be critical. And what's more, I think we can find evidence of the importance of their relationship in an ancient belief system that we've already discussed in prior videos. Gnosticism is an ancient spiritual philosophy given birth in a Roman world where ease of travel permitted the sharing and mingling of ideas from Hellenistic philosophy, Platonism, Judaism, and early Christianity. A Gnostic is one who knows, and Gnosticism is the striving of the believer to overcome the imperfect world of flesh to attain the perfect knowledge of the divine, of enlightenment. They believe that this imperfect world was created by a lower god, the Demiurge, but that a spark of the divine was trapped within the human body of each individual. Only gnosis, or spiritual knowledge, can free this divine spark and liberate those who seek it. Credence indeed has a powerful spirit trapped in his body, and he is seeking knowledge, knowledge of who he is. Will the enlightenment he anticipates release his obscurus into something powerfully transformative rather than destructive? But Credence is not alone in his journey. In Crimes of Grindelwald, he's found a loyal friend and powerful partner, one who is cursed, just as he is. To the Gnostics, the Holy Spirit was linked to Holy Wisdom, or Agia Sophia, envisioned as a woman, a goddess, Sophia was the soul, wisdom, and feminine aspect of God. In some writings, she's considered the Syzygy, the twin of Christ. In others, she's called the bride of Christ. And in one Gnostic writing, the book of Baruch, Sophia is called Edom. She appears as a snake woman. From the top, she's a woman, but her bottom half is a serpent. We've seen this figure hinted at in Melison, the keeper of the Hall of Records in the French ministry, who was the fabled half-woman, half-fish, or half-serpent of French legends. Could Credence represent Christ and Nagini the Holy Spirit? In a couple of prior videos, I discussed bestiaries and my theory that Credence may be an homunculus, an alchemical creation of both Albus and Gellert. If so, that would make them, or at least one of them, a creator god. I suspect Rowling is setting up a Gnostic cosmology here, with Albus and Gellert as opposing Gnostic gods, Albus as the monad, the distant but benign supreme god, and Gellert as the demiurge, the sometimes inept or often malevolent creator god, Credence as the Christ, and Nagini as Agia Sophia. But knowing what we know of Nagini's future role in Harry Potter, this link would create a lot of questions, as well as interesting possibilities. Although the Gnostic Sophia story varies among the different writings, it's usually a journey of a fall from grace, one that is linked to the fall of humanity, and then her redemption as she strives to reunite people with the divine as well. 
Gnosticism is a complex subject with many derivations. I've touched on it in a few videos, but haven't yet done a complete analysis because I wasn't sure how well it would be received. But now, having seen this murmuration scene, I'm more convinced than ever that it is playing a role. Please drop me a note in the comments if it would interest you and if you'd like me to explore more of what twist these links could mean for Credence and Nagini. Overall, this beautiful scene speaks to me of the transformative power of love, one of Rowling's greatest themes. Credence's Obscurus is transformed from a monster of atomic proportions to a natural symbol of peace and beauty, all because of the love of Nagini. In the first film, Credence was feared and abused, and his powers reflected that pain and suffering. But through Nagini, Credence finds a true friend, and his powers are transformed. Now we have to watch and see what will become of his Obscurus under the influence of Grindelwald. Before I end, just a couple more finer points. I mentioned Pentecost earlier. There is just a hint in the amphitheater scene of a perverted Pentecost. In the passage in Acts, it states, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Grindelwald's followers are all gathered together in one place. In an earlier version of the amphitheater scene, we saw them sending light from their wands to Grindy, like little shots of flames. And at the end of the scene, Grindelwald sends them out as his disciples. Go forth from this place and spread the word. Very religious wording to his followers and acolytes. Remember too that the very name Credence is a religious one. It hints of the Credence table, as we've discussed before. Credence is the host, the bread of Christ, of life. Could Nagini be the wine? Could her blood curse hint at the blood of Christ? So what do you all think? Am I overanalyzing again? But if not, what do you think this means for the future of Credence and Nagini? Now, a bit about my future plans. I'm back on track for regular videos, though perhaps not as frequently as right before and after the release of Crimes of Grindelwald. However, as we await for new information to release on FB3, I also have an urge to dip into some Harry Potter clues and analysis. So be sure to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications so you won't miss what's in store.